given that this is April 16th, which is one day after that infamous day of the year, April 15th, the deadline for filing your income tax return, we, of course, will have to discuss the income tax a little bit this evening. And a little later in the show, I'm going to tell you the surprising results of a national poll about taxes conducted by the Tax Foundation. But I'm not going to start off with that because I would like to cover something else so that anyone who calls in, whatever the subject that they want to talk about, they might have something to contribute to what I'm going to talk about now. And that is, of course, that I have said over and over and over and over and over again until you're sick of hearing it that government doesn't work, but that the marketplace is very adept at solving problems and so on. And my wife Pamela and I at dinner last night were talking about the fact that there are certain revolutionary developments that have taken place over the centuries that have profoundly changed human existence in the world and changed it for the positive, not for the negative. We're not talking about things like nuclear bombs or things of that sort. And uh, after the conversation, it occurred to me, of course, the obvious that all of these things were developed in the free market. And I thought it might be interesting to just go over some of these, well, not some, but all that I can think of as the main revolutionary developments that have profoundly changed human existence in the world. Uh, discoveries, creations that have taken place. I'm not talking about ideas as much as I am about actual physical things that have been developed. And so if you call into the show tonight and you have any thoughts about items that should be added to this list, I have come up with 11. If you think of any that should be added to the list, then I'd like to know about them. So let me run through them. And I'm going to do this in what I believe to be the chronological order and not the order of importance. The first is the printing press. Actually, printing started over 2,000 years ago, and it especially was prevalent in the Far East. But as far as really <laughs> stopping the presses or running the presses, it was Gutenberg, of course, who invented movable type in the 1400s. And that brought a profound change in human existence because it meant that knowledge was now available to virtually everyone, at least in the Western world, and that people were able to read about what was going on in the world. They were able to read of the history of the world. They were able to not only read about things that added to their knowledge, but added to their substance in the form of fiction and great works of literature. People were able to read the Bible and so forth. And I think that the printing press profoundly changed human existence. Number two on the list is surgery. It actually began thousands of years before Christ. Uh, the Egyptians did a lot of various kinds of surgery, but it was in the 1200s to the 1700s that surgery really came to the Western world. And surgery has always amazed me. I think the human body is a very vulnerable instrument. I mean, it seems as though there are so many working parts, and everything has to work correctly. If the heart doesn't get enough blood flowing to it, you can have a heart attack. If the brain doesn't get enough blood flowing to it, you can have a stroke. All sorts of terrible things can happen to you if you don't get enough to air to breathe, if, if you don't get enough uh, water and food in you for nourishment, and so on. And it just seems like the body is so sensitive that to think of somebody just sticking a knife in it and creating a hole and reaching in there, doing things like open-heart surgery and so on, it just amazes me. But obviously, the introduction of surgery into the Western world in the 1200s to the 1700s profoundly changed human existence because hundreds of millions of lives have undoubtedly been saved by the availability of surgery. The third item on the list, which of course is a very important one and one that you're already familiar with, is the Industrial Revolution. I believe, really, that the steam engine was the catalyst to the Industrial Revolution, and a Frenchman named Denis Papin, P-A-P-I-N, uh, first developed a steam engine in 1690 for pumping water. But then the first really practical engine was developed by an English inventor named Thomas Newcomen in 1712. But then finally, the man who really made the steam engine famous was James Watt in the middle uh, 1700s, who developed the steam engine that we all know about. And then at the start of the 1800s, a fellow named Richard Trevithick, and another fellow named Oliver Evans devised non-condensing steam machines that made such things as steam-powered locomotives and even automobiles eventually possible. They really did make steam engines practical. Well, that led to the Industrial Revolution because it was now possible to mass-produce things. There were also coal-powered machines that contributed to the Industrial Revolution. And uh, once the Industrial Revolution got underway, it was only a matter of time till the specialization of labor took over and you had assembly line production. And that brought about low-cost products that were available to everyone instead of just to the very rich. And that contributed, obviously, to the development of the kind of prosperity that we take for granted today. The poorest person in uh, society in America today lives better than a king lived back in the 1500s or 1600s. 
The fourth item on my list is locomotion in the form of locomotives. The first one, to the best of my knowledge, was constructed in 1804 by that same Richard Trevithick, who developed a steam engine, and he applied the steam engine then to a locomotive and created the kind of transportation that had never been available before. Everything before any kind of long-distance transportation relied on horses, either a rider on a horse or a stagecoach or some other kind of horse-drawn locomotion. But now we had steam-powered locomotives that could travel across a country like America or throughout Europe and so on. And this changed human existence because it created much more interdependence among countries. It facilitated trade. Uh, the trading of products from one country to another became much, much more prevalent, and that expanded the division of labor then so that you now had not only the products produced in your own country available to you, but products produced in other parts of the world. And so human existence took a big step upward. A really important development, which is number five on my list, was the harnessing of electricity. And, of course, we all know about Thomas Edison and all the inventions of the electric light and various other things that he developed. But it really was a group of various different scientists during the 1800s who studied the subject and developed the various little mechanisms that would actually harness electricity and then transmit it. And it was Thomas Edison who then took all this scientific knowledge and applied it to individual products. And, of course, our life would be just completely incomprehensible without electricity. It would be, we would be living on such a lower existence without the ability to move things through electricity, without the ability to see things because of electric lights. And we depend upon electricity so much as we find out whenever the local government-run power company or the government monopoly uh, private enterprise power company suddenly turns off our electricity and we go 8, 16, 24, 32 hours without electricity and we suddenly realize how much we depend upon it. Number six on my list is automobiles, obviously. Opened up a world of travel to each individual, the ability to drive across a city, not just across a country as locomotives did, but to just go anywhere you needed to. And uh, this, of course, like everything else, was a long-term development. The internal combustion engine was first really developed in 1860, or at least applied to the idea of a horseless carriage. And to the best of my knowledge, it was a man named Jean-Joseph Etienne Lanoir, who, surprisingly, was French. And his first horseless carriage was capable of driving at about four miles an hour. And then in 1876, a guy named Nicholas August Otto, undoubtedly a German, introduced the first car that we could consider to be a direct ancestor of the kind of cars that we drive today. And then, in, uh, of course, in the late 1880s, uh, the couple of guys named Gottlieb Daimler and Carl Benz formed a company called Daimler Benz, who still today produces the Mercedes Benz, and they began to really turn out the automobiles. It was actually uh, Ransom Olds, the founder of the Oldsmobile, who first used an assembly line to produce cars, but it was Henry Ford, as we all know, who perfected it, and because he did, he dominated the automobile market until eventually in the 1920s, General Motors began to catch up and surpass Ford and remain the leading automobile manufacturer in the United States, I believe, right up to the present time. I think General Motors is still number one. Next development, which I find to be important, was the harnessing of radio waves. And I don't think that many people realize the full ramifications of the ability to use radio waves to make things happen. And this began in the late 1800s. But today we rely on the radio waves, the ability to transmit uh, voices and other information by radio waves has made it possible for such things as television, uh, cell phones, CBs, all kinds of things that rely on radio waves to transmit things through the ether to other people. And for that, we rely on two people who are known in history, Guglielmo Marconi and Heinrich Hertz. Then we come to number eight, which is air travel. And that, of course, has just broadened human existence tremendously by the ability to get to other places so quickly. If I have to fly from Nashville to California, it takes uh, about four or five, six hours, somewhere in there, and I think this is horrible that I have to be in an airplane for so long. But just imagine if I had to drive it, it might take several days. Just imagine if I had to walk it, it might take even a week. Well, maybe longer than that. And, of course, we thank the Wright brothers for that, who in 1903 actually got an airplane off the ground, and that was a gasoline engine-powered airplane. There were, of course, balloons and other things of that sort before. The interesting thing about that White Bro uh, Wright Brothers' um, first flight was that they traveled 120 feet, which is less than the wingspan on a 747. It's amazing. It's amazing how big airplanes are now. 
Ninth on my list is refrigeration. Until World War I, uh, refrigeration relied on ice boxes, but then electric refrigerators came into being. And the whole concept of refrigeration was very, very important because it meant that food could be stored over long periods of time instead of having to rely on constant reaching for food, buying food, growing food, so forth. It also meant that things could be eaten out of season. But more than anything else, it meant that food storage was available, and that probably saved a great many lives simply because what is really, in essence, fresh food was available to people, and they didn't have to eat food that might be too old and uh, cause toxics that uh, resulted in death and so forth. Number 10 is penicillin, and along with other antibiotics and prescription drugs, have saved millions, hundreds of millions of lives, I'm sure. Alexander Fleming was the one who first developed penicillin in 1928, and then, of course, all sorts of developments have taken place since then. And the final item on my list is, obviously, and you're going to guess this one easily, the computer. And it seems strange that we are so dependent upon computers today, and yet probably not one person in a hundred listening to this broadcast had a computer 25 years ago. I happened to have my first computer in 1975. And it was a business computer produced by Hewlett Packard, and I replaced it in 1978 with another one, which I kept until uh, 1989 when I finally got a PC, and have had a series of PCs since then. But the development of computers is rather interesting. In 1623, a German scientist named Wilhelm Schickard invented a machine that used various sprocketed wheels that could together add and with the aid of logarithm tables actually multiply and divide but of course it had no power behind it it had to be manually operated and then in 1642 the famous french philosopher and mathematician blaise pascal invented a machine that could add and subtract and it would automatically carry and borrow digits from column to column the way we do when we uh, do this by hand with a pencil and piece of paper and Pascal actually built 50 copies of his machine, but it was really just a curiosity that uh, he gave to his wealthy friends as gifts. But Pascal has always been remembered, and there was a, a computer programming language called Pascal, which may still be used for all I know, but was used for many, many years. And then in uh, the early, 19, uh, early 1800s, a Frenchman named Joseph-Marie Jacquard used punch cards to operate silk looms. And in 1820s, uh, Charles Babbage developed what he called a difference engine and then an analytical engine, which were uh, what you might call mechanical gizmos that were meant to solve mathematical problems. The first electronic calculator was developed by Herman Hollerith, and it was actually used for the 1980 census in the United States, and that was the beginning of computer power. And during the 1920s and 30s, there was progress in developing the whole concept of electronic computers, and of course one of the leaders in that was a company that later became known as IBM. And the Mark I, uh, which was developed for IBM, was, I believe, the first calculator to use binary numbers, which means that everything was based on zeros and ones. We use the decimal system in our daily lives. That means that there are columns of numbers. There are ones, there are tens, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, hundred thousands, and so forth, all powers of ten. Uh, in the different columns. But binary numbers use only two numbers. Instead of having ten digits, it has only two digits, zero and a one. And so what you have are a string of zeros and ones that comprise a number. Uh, Let's see how we can explain this. Let's take the number 178. It would be represented by 10110010. It would mean that there is one The first one means 128, the zero means there are no 64s, the next one means there's a 32, the next one means there's a 16, the zero means there's no 8, the next zero means there's no 4, the one means there's a 2, and the zero means there's no 1. And if you add all those up, you get 178. But the reason it has to be binary numbers is so that you can have a series of switches that are either off or on. With the decimal system where you have 10 possible digits, uh, there's no way to portray that mechanically. No way that you can have a series of switches and figure out whether a switch is supposed to represent 7 or 5 or whatever. So everything has to be based around 0 or 1. And it means that in your computer, there are millions and millions and millions of these little switches, or they're called gates once they got inside the computer. But an interesting thing about all this having to do with the free market and government is that during the Second World War, the government tried to develop a computer in order to help aim artillery and Needless to say, the war ended before the computer was built. And after the war, private companies took over the development of computers, and then progress followed very rapidly. Uh, One of the big movers in computers was John von Neumann, a Hungarian-American. And in 1945, he was the first to be able to create a computer that actually stored a program within the computer's memory so that it could do a whole series of calculations without human intervention. 
Um, one more thing about computers. Uh, someone named Moore, and I should have looked up his first name before uh, the broadcast, but I forgot to do so, but he was a famous uh, computer scientist, made the statement that eventually, uh, made a statement at a conference once, a technical conference, that eventually evolved into what was called Moore's Law, and that was that computer power doubles every 18 months without an increase in cost. In other words, if a computer is X speed, can process at X speed, right now in 18 months it'll process at twice the speed without increasing in price in any way whatsoever. And if a computer can hold X amount of storage at this point in history, 18 months from now, it'll be able to do twice that without increasing uh, the cost in any way whatsoever. Very quickly, some other possible items for the revolutionary list are indoor plumbing, eyeglasses, irrigation, water purification, photography, and my very, very, very favorite development of human existence, the symphony orchestra. To me, it is a wonder of nature that a symphony orchestra can create the sounds that it does. And I'm talking about today's symphony orchestra. In the days of Mozart or Bach, the instruments were quite different. They were not as pleasing to the ear. They, the orchestras were not as large. But what orchestras can do today with the music of Sibelius or Rachmaninoff or Dvorak or Mahler or Wagner, it just <laughs> overwhelms me. And of course, I love music, and without music, life to me would be absolutely tasteless. All right, let's see what Michael in Kentucky has to say this evening. Good evening, Michael. I think your uh, subject's very intriguing. Uh, in, of course, it's a double, technology can be a double-edged sword. And I, what uh, the rule on the computers you were talking about, where things uh, are uh, doubled every so many months, supposedly. I think there's also the flip side of that. I think it's, it's some technologies that I've uh, occasionally you'll hear mentioned, you know, or in off uh, in uh, technology type publications like whatever popular science or popular mechanics, and you never hear about them anymore. It's uh, you know, oh, this guy has developed a way to get rid of nuclear waste by injecting it into molten slag surplus from steel and break the uh, radioactive bonds and create an inert. Uh, and inert uh, stuff that can be... You, well, know, you, like, you just lost me there. <laughs> well, you're, you're, okay. Well, <laughs> you know, it, uh, or uh, even occasionally it gets mentioned on something like NPR or something, some technology like that, and you never hear about it anymore, and we've got all this problem with Yucca Mountain trying to get, you know, uh, be, for, so, be forced to bury the nuclear waste. I see. So what you're saying is that the technology has some byproducts of it that uh, we don't hear much about but are negative rather than positive. Well, uh, well yeah, just on that one subject, uh, you know, nuclear power is probably the most expensive and dangerous uh, way to boil water ever conceived of by man. <laughs> I mean, that's essentially, you know, boiling it down. But, well, but, uh, you, but, but we're not trying to soft boil eggs here. We're trying to light up a city. Uh, well, yeah, that, that's true. But I think, uh, of course, you're probably familiar with some of the Tesla experiments where in uh, transmitting power and things like that. that Nikolai Tesla? Yeah, General yeah. Electric, General Electric uh, let him do some research, but I, I think they, they tried to shut him down, too, because they, they did not want him to develop a way to transmit power that could not be regulated. Well, uh, for, for, for anybody who doesn't know whom we're talking about, Nikolai Tesla uh, was uh, a scientist of 100 years ago who... Actually, he was in the 30s, just when he worked for GE, I think. Oh, he was still around then? I yeah, know. He, was, he, was in, he worked uh, originally for, uh, for, uh, for Edison, and develop, he developed alternating current, and Edison did not want alternating current because right. he was stuck on direct current. Right, but uh, alternating current eventually did become the, the way of life. We still use, that's what AC and DC are, uh, and we still use DC for portable things a great deal uh, and for uh, sometimes uh, converting foreign power and so on, but basically the plugs in your home are using alternating current thanks to Nikola Tesla, Tesla mm -hmm. uh, an Italian scientist. And as you say, uh, uh, what did you say about he didn't uh, he he developed something that uh, GE didn't want to be he, regulated? He, he was working on uh, ways to bounce power long distances without transmission lines and was using receiving antennas to excite a current and uh, be able to transmit power without wires. And of course, oh, the so you're saying that that wouldn't be regulated? Well, it would be uh, it would it would uh, really squash their infrastructure, wouldn't it? I mean, it would really cause problems if you could transmit power without all those interstate. Uh, Transmission lines. <laughs> right, but but you see, in the free market, when something like that happens, the person who develops it might be working for a company who has a tremendous investment uh, in the exi in the existing uh, structures. But like Edison. But there are always other companies that uh, don't have that kind of investment already and well, are will be very very eager to uh, to welcome such developments because it means that they can become a player in the market with a much much smaller investment. And so these things, we always hear these conspiracy stories that there's a pill you could drop in your gas tank and you could get 100 miles to the gallon. But of course, General Motors, uh, not General Motors, but uh, Exxon and everybody else. 
Congress has uh, uh, stifled it, but uh, suppressed it. But the, th those things really don't happen in the free market. If there's something that can be done, it'll get done if it will improve human existence. It, well, unless you're so big that you can uh, suppress it, or, you know. Well, uh, there the is... government gets involved sometimes with that sort of thing too, where things get uh, patented and not brought to market. Well, you have raised a very important point. It is very hard for us to realize because we see these companies that do maybe even a hundred billion dollars in sales every year, and we think this company is so big it can do anything it wants. But no one is bigger than the marketplace. There is no company that can control the market because there will always be competitors that will be able to get around it, and they can even get around the government. Not even the government is big enough to control the market. Do you have anything further to say? Hang on, Michael. We'll be right back, folks. Don't go away. This is Harry Brown. And, Michael, do you have something further you want to say? I wanted to tell you about a piece of technology that I heard about about 13 years ago that uh, also disappeared off the radar screen, and you seem to know a little bit about computers. Uh, and then I want to ask you a question well, because I'm the, trying to the, figure out where you're coming from. The operative words are a little bit. Yeah, well, me too. I know enough to be dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> Good and I, and I, after, after assembly language class and having to deal with multiple, <laughs> at the oh. time that I was in computers, there were so many different keyboards and so many different function keys out there for different terminals, I just said, forget it. And then, of course, they standardized the PC, but it was too late for me to, to get back into it. I, I moved on to other things. But yes, and assembly language was horrendous. Oh, well, hexadecimal, hexadecimal, you're talking about binary. Hexadecimal and uh, the mnemonics is really what made computers practical. So if, you, if you're good at hexadecimal and assembly language, you've got a future. <laughs> uh, but uh, there was a development about 1992 or 1993 where they had developed a way to grow crystals in a, in a very uniform fashion to make uh, silicon cubes that were around about an inch cube. And with error correction, they used three of those. They had little stepper lasers that uh, were synchronized in the, in the uh, vertical and horizontal axis. And they could step through that uh, cube, one-inch cube of silicone in a uniform fashion and polarize the molecules of silicone to either represent a one or zero. And that one little cube of silicone could store at that time uh, the sum of all human knowledge with room to spare for decades and decades. Including, all the, talking about, including talking, all the baseball scores. Every piece of trivia you would want to put on there. Uh, and, it, you know, we're talking about 13 years ago. And that has never come to market. Well, all I can say is that there are a lot of stories floating around, and I wouldn't begin to know how to verify them. And so I take most of them with a grain of salt and assume that if somebody could prove them, then, then it would be worth knowing, and it would, but it would be brought to my attention. I wouldn't have to go looking for it. So I don't know what to say about something like that. All I know is computers continue to develop, and they're amazing. If you, if you look at the size of a hard disk that's in your computer, yeah. it's about the size of a CD, roughly speaking, but it's a little thicker, uh, of course, than a CD. But here this thing holds... Uh, I've got one. I've got two of them in my computer. One of them holds about 80 billion bytes, and the other one holds about, I think it's 250. It's been a year and a half since I put it in. 250 billion bytes, and that and a byte is eight bits. A bit is either the zero or one. So you're talking about. Uh, <laughs> let me see here. You're talking about two trillion uh, of those zeros or ones. And how in the world? All of that can be stored on that disk is just amazing to me. It's even more amazing than the fact that you can stick a knife in somebody's body and stick your hand in there and do some things and actually make that person healthier than he was before the surgery started. Well, I could recommend a movie that would, you might find the time to and be entertained by called uh, Chain Reaction with uh, Keanu Reeves and uh, Morgan Freeman. Have you seen that one? No, I haven't. It deals with the theoretical implications of unleashing such a technology and a destabilizing effect that it would have. And he, uh, that and would de destabilize whole industries and workforces and economies. And I think it is a little bit naive to believe that, that they're not, uh, you know, overlords or operatives out there trying to make sure something like that doesn't happen. Well, and yet 20 years from today, we will look back at today as being an absolute primitive existence compared to what will be possible 20 years from today, provided the government doesn't get in the way <laughs> and bring everything to a halt. Uh, are, you, are you saying that you're totally against... Uh, and when you're saying you're, you're pro-free market, you're not for patent and uh, there are, of intellectual property. There are only two forms of uh, uh, societal structure. Either you have a free market where the government does not intervene at all, or you have a government-dominated market, because there is no such thing as a little government any more than there is such a thing as being a little bit pregnant. And if we did not have the government uh, managing patents and copyrights and other things of that, the free market would develop ways by which you as an author or an inventor would be completely safe in your intellectual property, but the government has, in effect, pushed everybody else out of the market. Michael, thanks so much for your call. I really appreciate it. We have an email from Mike D. in Jacksonville, Florida. 
And he says, could plastics also be included on your list? Lightweight, durable, air and watertight alternatives to wood, stone, and metal items. Yeah, that's a very good point. I, I don't know that I would consider plastics as revolutionary as such things as locomotion, the printing press, the industrial revolution, and so on, but they certainly have changed our lives in a lot of ways and for the better. And Mike goes on to say, please don't forget advances in farming. Everything from the plow to genetic engineering have created efficient production of food to support just about any size population. Advances have also made our food supply free of pests and disease, allowing larger harvests. Very, very good point. No question about that, and especially the part about uh, finding ways to free the harvests from pests and disease. Uh, This is a very, very important part of it. We live so much better, as I said, than the kings and royalties of Europe and Asia did 200 years ago or even a hundred years ago, or even yesterday, I don't know. In any event, I think that these are good points, Mike, and I appreciate them very, very, very much. Now let me ask you a question, and I'll be glad to hear from anybody on this subject. Can you name a development, a creation, an invention of any kind that revolutionized human existence for the better that was a product of a government, any government, American government, British government, Chinese government, the government of Somalia, (laughs) the government of Indonesia, whatever. Can you name anything? You know, the race was on back in the 40s to develop a cure for polio. And a fellow named Jonas Salk was working with private money, and a man named Sabin, and I do not recollect his first name, was working with government money. And Salk got to the market about two or three years ahead of Sabin and gave us our first polio vaccine, which effectively wiped polio out as a threat That doesn't mean that no one ever got polio after that, but it was very, very, very rare in a country like the United States. The Sabin vaccine improved upon it by making an oral vaccine rather than one that had to be injected. But it came, as I said, two or three years after Sabin got his to market. So anyway, give me a call and tell me if you know of some government-produced development that changed human existence for the better. And please do not name the nuclear bombs. I don't want to keep Don in Pennsylvania waiting, so let's uh, take a phone call. Don, you with us? Yeah, am I coming through, Claire? Yes, you certainly are. Hey, I have listened to your show, I think, for a couple of years now, and um, it's the first time I've ever called your show. Uh, I enjoy it very much. Um, I had a... We're glad to hear from you. <laughs> Great. You, had a, you asked a real good question. There's two things. That, what is it, any government or a specific government? Or, any or, government. Okay, what about government in general? Uh, uh, yeah, all government. Well, uh, one of the great developments I believe the government came, that government in general came up with is law enforcement. It's one of the few. I'm, I'm a big critic of government, but I believe that one of the good things that it did end up developing is law enforcement in general. Well, I, I take it what you mean by law enforcement is uh, reducing the amount of violence in society. Yeah, keeping the general, keeping the uh, control of general welfare, or not control of. Um, sure, he has general welfare. Well, you know I mean? yes, but I find it hard to consider that much of an accomplishment when crime is at such high levels as it is today. And of course, okay, but the fact that law enforcement exists means that my mom can be assured of a general level of safety. Or not, not assured of, but that, that somebody would do something about something if, if she were wrong or hurt you know, criminally. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, the fact that law enforcement it may not be so much creation of government as a society. You know, because the neighbors would get together and go lynch a guy. Well, I think, I think that's uh, an important point, but I think it's even more important to realize that if we did not have police forces for some reason, then your neighbors and you would get together and figure out a way, a low-cost way of protecting yourselves from those who would do you violence. There have always been thugs in this world, but in good societies, the thugs are dissuaded from acting on their natural impulses, and they eventually find jobs and, and uh, migrate into the society itself. But when government is responsible and, and government gets bigger and bigger and bigger, less and less attention is paid towards reducing violence in society, and more and more in, uh, attention is paid to social change, to subsidies, uh, both to rich people and to poor people, and all kinds of political developments take place. And that's what we have now in this society. We have crime rates that are absolutely astronomical well, by the standards of uh, 100 years ago. Well, that was my, my next um my, my next uh, thing that I said that I believe, I believe the two things were invented well by government. One uh, the second one was the law enforcement in general itself. The second thing that I feel that um government government invented was the um was those guys that pick up my garbage every week. <laughs> in case they're listening, you know um they uh, okay anyway. Uh, uh, let, let me tell you something about picking up garbage. Um, what, what do you do? Do you wheel the cans out to the curb every every uh, week? Yeah, we drop ours off. Yeah, once a week. Yeah, out there. Uh, okay, you know I happen to be one of those fortunate people in America, of which there are very few, but I happen to be one of those fortunate people who lives in an area where the government doesn't pick up the garbage. And as a result, 
there are about, I, I think it's about eight garbage companies that service this area. And uh, it was two or three years ago that this subject came up in, in one of my video shows. So at a break, I quickly looked in the yellow pages to see how many companies there were. And I don't remember what it was. It might have been even many as 13, but there's so many. Every single, uh, I should say, two days a week, Mondays and Thursdays, they come. I don't have to wheel them out to the, to the curb. The, the uh, garbage cans are right by my garage, which is attached to the house. So I don't have to go out in the rain and wheel the things out or anything else. And you know what they charge me? Twenty dollars a month. Really? Okay. Well, then I digress, and I got to get back to work on my newsletter. Okay, but but uh, let me just make my point about this. When you don't know what private enterprise can do, and government is doing it, it is easy to believe that only government can do it, or only government can do it at a lower cost. But take away the government, and you suddenly find out that everybody's coming forward with, well, let's do it this way. No, no, we could do it this way. Oh, here's another way. Oh, we'll charge this. No, we'll charge that. And you suddenly find out that all these ideas are available now, instead of one way being imposed upon everybody. Well, don't get me wrong. Now, I, I feel I'm a value producer. I try to produce more value than I consume as a consumer. Sure. Unlike, unlike any government agency, any government agent. I, I don't like non-value producers like government agents and religious mystics and so on and so on. But I just, you know, I want to say one, try to say one kind of thing about it. But now that I think about it, no government didn't invent law enforcement. Very good. Oh, I'm so full. I got to <laughs> doctor give me a heck. Hey, have hey. a great night, and I love your show. Oh, thank you. Well, obviously, then you're no fool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, bye. Thanks. Bye-bye, Don. Thanks Thanks so very much. I'm still listening, though. Bye. Okay, good. Uh, All right, let's get started on the income tax. We're coming up to a break in uh, two or three minutes, but we'll get started. I mentioned at the top of the show that the Tax Foundation had just released a week or so ago the results of this survey that was done uh, using the normal polling techniques and so on. And let me just give you the answers to some of the questions that they asked. A lot of them were, you know, what's your height and weight, (laughs) what's your religion, and are you married, and all that sort of thing. But... How would you rate the value you personally get from the taxes you pay to the federal government? Those who said excellent or pretty good amounted to 25%. Those who said only fair or poor, 66%, and then 9% were not sure. Question. Considering all government services on the one hand and taxes on the other, which of the following statements comes closest to your view? Decrease services and taxes, 34%. Keep taxes and services about where they are, 30%. Increase services and raise taxes, 13%. Not sure, 23%. So that's kind of a fairly close call, but decrease both services and taxes slightly outweighs. We, I've mentioned on this show other polls where it didn't even mention lowering your taxes, just said decrease government services uh, and government itself, and got an overwhelming figure like 60 70%. All right. This, this is a no-brainer. Do you consider the amount of federal income tax you have to pay as, and too high was said by 55%, about right was said by 33%, and too low was said by 2%. Those were the, the inmates at the local institution. All right, now here's a very, very important question, and I want you to listen closely, and don't ever tell me again that the American people have chosen security over liberty. What is the maximum percentage of a person's income that should go to taxes That is all taxes, state, federal, and local. Now, I'm not asking you what you think it should be, 0, 1, or 2 percent. I'm asking you what you think a cross-section of the American people thought when they were asked this question. Well, here's the answer. 2 percent of them said 50 to 59 percent. 3 percent of them said 40 to 49 percent. 7 percent said 30 to 39 percent. So right away here we have 12 percent said 30 percent or higher. 23% 23% said 20 to 29%, 41% said 10 to 19%, and 20% said 1 to 9%. That means 61%, pardon me, I left out the best category of all, 3% said that it should be 0%, is the amount you should pay in taxes. So, here's my point. 64% of those questioned said that it should be less than 20%, that you paid total Federal, state, and local taxes, 64%, which is just a tad under two-thirds of the American people, think that we should pay less than 20% of our incomes in taxes, total, state, federal, and local. Now, how much do we actually pay in federal, state, and local taxes? Well, the U.S. Bureau of the Census used to calculate this figure every year, ruling out all kind of double taxation, you know, money that gets passed between the state and federal governments and so on, and just figuring exactly how much of the national income goes to taxes. The last time they did this, which was 12 years ago, the figure was 47%. And it is very, very difficult for me to believe that it has gone down since then, but it is very possible it's gone up. So while we are paying roughly 47% 
of our incomes in federal, state, and local taxes, meaning income taxes, property taxes, sales taxes, excise taxes, tariffs, telephone taxes, and so on, while we're paying 47% of our income in all these taxes, two-thirds of the American people, roughly, think that we should be paying less than 20% of our incomes for these taxes. So, would you say the American people are on our side in wanting much smaller government than we have now? Now, you can say if you want, yes, they want to pay less in taxes, but, boy, they don't want to give up their subsidies. Well, nobody's ever offered them something in exchange for those subsidies, whether it's a student loan or Medicare or whatever it may be. And I believe, as I've told you before, that we have a powerful weapon in the great libertarian offer where we say to people, would you give up your favorite federal programs if it meant you never had to pay income tax again? And your children would never have to pay income tax, and your grandchildren could go through their whole lives never even knowing that there was an income tax once. And that is a very powerful question. And the times that I have asked it over the last 10 years, the answer that I get over and over and over and over again is, yes, of course I would give up my favorite federal programs if that were the reward. The American people are really on our side. And all we need to do is to find a way. Well, I say all we need to do. It's a powerful job and it's not an easy job. But what we need to do is to find a way to harness that sentiment and get all these people who don't vote because they know intuitively that it isn't going to make any difference, get all those people to start going out and voting, not for the Republican or Democrat who seems to be the lesser of two evils, but for a libertarian who is actually promising and devoted to the task of doing something about this. All right, let's get back to the phones before we go on with the survey, because there's some more interesting answers to questions that I think you will enjoy. Let's talk to Owen now in Washington. Good evening, Owen. Good evening. Is that uh, Washington, D.C. or Washington, Washington State? Washington, D.C. Washington State? Yes. Okay, well, what's on your mind tonight? Well, uh, it's kind of interesting uh, that you will bring up the whole income tax thing, because I haven't studied income tax, federal income tax. I studied tax law in my free time. Uh-huh. And I've learned that the income tax, as imposed by federal law, U uh, U.S. Code Title 26, only applies to foreigners. Well, I'm sorry... It's, it's foreigners at home, citizens abroad. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but the income tax code, which is a law passed by Congress, spells out who is liable for taxes, and right. it, and it doesn't say anything about foreigners or citizens abroad. And Actually, uh, I, I've heard this story over and over and over again for the last 25 years. And uh, I, I, at the next break, I will dig up the actual section of the code that says who has to pay income tax, and I can assure you, it does not limit it to anyone. Uh, right, then what about withholding that? What about that? Section 1441, 1442, 1443, and 1461. Well, if there were some way to uh, evade those... That, that covers uh, only, those sections only cover withholding of foreigners. Well, if there were some way to show that you didn't have to have your taxes withheld, you would still owe it on April 15th at the end of, uh, uh, at the end of the, every calendar year. Uh, the you, can, you can only file the income tax if you have a Social Security number. Well, you are asked for your Social Security number, and if you don't have one, so then... Okay, then. What form do you file then? You'll file the 2555 for any taxable income. What's a 2555? That's the form used by foreigner, or by, excuse me, by citizens and resident aliens to report taxable income. No, the 1040 is where you no, read. No, that's for foreigners. Read the, read the OMB control number and it refers back to subtitle A, which is income tax under the code. Then it gets back into the section of foreigners. But that's because you think only foreigners owe it. That's because that's the only thing that says it, that who owes it. It's only you're, you're, say, you're, saying that there's, you're saying that there's a section of the code where it says only foreigners so are liable for income tax. Now, you've got to understand the goal. You have to understand U.S. law first. It's positive law. If the code does not say you have to do it, then by default you do not have to do it. Yes, but the code does say that anybody uh, with a certain uh, income level has to pay it. And I'll give you that when we come back from the break. And right now we're talking with Owen in Washington State about whether or not American citizens have to pay income tax. And, U.S. citizens. Uh, U.S. citizens, American, whatever. Um, and let me tell you something, Owen. Uh, you can, if you like, go on the assumption that you don't have to pay income tax. And if you do, then give my regards to Irwin Schiff when you arrive at federal prison, because Irwin has been peddling the story for uh, 25 or 30 years and has now served three stretches in the federal penitentiary. And there are others also. And there are people who have done this, failed to file for five or six years, and no. not run into any trouble whatsoever. And they how, about filing, how about not filing for over 20 years? Well, if you have managed to make yourself unknown to the system, then that's possible. But if you have just simply, if you have a job or something... 25 years. Well, you're not listening to me, Owen. If you have managed to make yourself invisible to the system, then you might get away with it, but you are always in danger of being caught. But if you are, uh, if you have a job and uh, W-4s are filed and so forth and you don't do it, Owen, Owen, you have to stop interrupting me. And you do this, 
uh, for four or five or six years. You can then say to your friends and everybody, see, I'm doing it. I've been doing it for four or five years, and nobody's ever stopped me, and they never came after me, and so on. But what happens is the Internal Revenue Service will not go after you after the first year. They want to see you do this for five or six years to, um, to establish two things. Number one, that this was not just simple mistake that occurred one year, but that this is a pattern of willful, willful, willful disobedience. And number two, and, right, and number two, that you have accumulated a tax liability now that is great enough to make it worth their while to prosecute the case. Now, with regard to who must pay income tax, paragraph 36442. Person, uh, 36442. 36442. Person, paragraph. We're talking about section. Well, it's listed as a par- Listen to me, Owen. I, I, I got the tax code here in front of me. That's why I'm. All right. To just listen to me, Owen. Paragraph 36442. Persons require, required to make returns of income, section 6012. Returns with respect to income taxes shall be made by the following. Every individual having for the taxable year gross income which exceeds or equals the exemption amount, except that a return shall not be required of an individual, and then it gives some exceptions of people who are, uh, do not have enough income to do it and so forth. And then it goes on to define what gross income is and so on and so forth. And there is nothing in any of this about people who uh, live in the United States are Six, exempt. 6012, Procedure and Administration, Subtitle F, right? I'm at Information the, returns, chapter 61. I'm at subtitle. I'm, I'm at uh, subparagraph A, general rule, returns with. Okay, I'm, I'm talking about. Okay, title 26, okay, internal revenue code. So title F, which is procedure and administration, chapter 261, information and returns. Which part? Uh, return statements and special returns? Part 1? Part section two, section uh, 6012. Why don't we make it easy? Why don't you just read to me the section that says that U.S. citizens do not have to pay taxes? Or that <laughs> says, or that, <laughs> says <laughs> that the tax code. What part of positive law do you not understand? I do understand it. All right. It's just not that a U.S. citizen has to file. Just, all right, just explain to me who does have to file and where it says who has to file. All right, first off, when you're dealing with income tax, you have to understand that the code only says you have to withhold income tax from foreigners. Follow me so far. No, the code doesn't say you... Okay, it's okay, income tax. Let's go to subtitle A. Read it to me. All right, let's go over here. All right, I'm going to open up subtitle A, which is income taxes. All right, which step do we want to go to? Normal taxes, third taxes, tax on self-employment income? No, wait a second. Uh, taxes on, uh, taxes of, tax on, uh, following the tax on non-resident aliens and foreign corporations? Oh, and you told, returns. Oh, and you told me that it only applies to foreigners. Read That's to me. Tax. Read to, income tax. Income tax. Read to me where it says it only applies to foreigners. It doesn't have to say it only applies to foreigners. Say where it, it, does the, not say, it does not say it applies to citizens. Well, it says... The only time a citizen would have to pay is if they would tell the tax from a foreigner or non-resident... It says it's withholding the tax... It's, 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 uh, if they withhold the money from a non-resident alien and or a foreign corporation. Uh, that's the only time a U.S. citizen has to pay. No, Owen, I don't, think, I, don't think you, I don't think you understand that the income tax preceded the withholding tax. That we no, had, no, 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 I'm not talking about the Title C. We had in- the income wage taxes. No, we're, we're we, dealing with two different things here. We had we income... Wait, 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 let's stick to one tax. Are we going to deal with the, inco- uh, the, the income tax or are we going to deal with the employment wage taxes? Uh, oh, and you're starting to run circles around things no, no, here. Yes, yes, you, this, wait, this whole thing started when you said Americans did not owe income tax. I owed income tax, but you switched, the income, you, you switched subjects to voluntary employment wage taxes. That's a different tax. I never mentioned that. You, yes, start, you, 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 you brought up withholding tax. tax. You brought up withholding tax. Okay. You have the code in front of you? No, of course not. I, I, have, I, have, I, have, I have sections of the code. Uh, Owen, you have to understand how the code applies. You have to understand how the section applies. Owen, let me, Owen, let, Owen, let me make a suggestion. Get yourself your own radio program and read the whole code to your audience, but we're not going to continue this any further because all of this, this, this has become chaos, Owen, and we don't have chaos on this show. 6012. That doesn't say I have to file. That makes no liability on me. 1451 would. It says returns with respect to income must be made by the following, and then it lists the, the, uh, the requirements, and the requirements apply to anybody of a certain income or higher, and it does not distinguish between uh, uh, residents or foreigners. And that, oh, and that's, oh, and that's it for this. Thank you very much for calling, and if you want to talk about something else sometime, then give me a call. All right. Um, I'm sorry to be so abrupt by this, but this conversation was reduced to chaos, and we don't have chaos on this show, and we have discussed this over and over. And... I have to tell you, as I have said before, that the world is just full of people who say, yes, I know Irwin Schiff went to prison, yes, I know so-and-so went to prison, yes, I know this, I know that, and so forth, but now we have figured out a much more airtight case, and no one has to pay income tax. And then three or four years later, the leader of that movement gets peddled off to prison. Now, it is entirely possible that if you can earn money in some way that you remain invisible to the system, that you might evade it. But you haven't evaded it, uh, avoided it legally, you have evaded it illegally, and you are always in the jeopardy of being caught and being sent off to prison. We have uh, Joe in Boston on the line, but I'm going to ask him to wait uh, just a couple minutes because there were a couple more things. Let's go back to the survey. The 
I told you that 64% said that we should be paying less than 20% in taxes, federal, state, and local. The average response of all the survey takers was 16% as being the highest percentage anybody should have to pay in taxes. And then the question was, in reality, what percentage of income do you think the typical American actually pays in taxes? That is all taxes, state, federal, and local. And the average response there was 29%. So roughly what we're saying is that people thought that the tax load should be about one-half of what it is now. And then there were various other questions about which is the fairest kind of tax and so forth. And I'm not going to get into those because we're running out of time rapidly. And I do want to uh, deal with some emails very quickly. What about the space program, which has made much of our technology possible? Actually, it's made practically no technology possible at all. The, spa the space program had one spectacular success, sending men to the moon, and everything it has done since then has proven to be a failure. The space shuttle, the, the uh, space lab, all of these things, none of them have produced any of the results uh, by which NASA was able to extract billions of dollars from Congress. Uh, on the basis of promises of what would be produced. Uh, Gene says, one good thing from the U.S. government, the Panama Canal. <laughs> oh, God, I don't know about that. Uh, it was uh, wrenched, of course, by the deaths of a lot of people by uh, a fraud perpetrated on the Colombian government, which actually owned that area at that particular time. And uh, whether it has been worth the cost and the deaths that have occurred since it was uh, built, is very, very difficult to say because there are always other ways of doing things. Uh, Peter suggested the Internet, but th that's really just an extension of the computer revolution. And uh, Gene also asked, do you have any speculation on the viability and safety of free market nuclear power? I believe that um, most likely the free market would find nuclear power to be a low-cost, safe form of energy. But we don't really know because the government insulated it from liability, the nuclear power in industry, uh, at the time of Three Mile Island, that disaster. And, again, because the free market do isn't operating, we don't even know what the real costs of these various forms of energy are. And so, as a result, we can't really evaluate them, and the market doesn't. Gene says also the name of the computer used to develop the hydrogen bomb was Maniac. Well, that's not a surprise. And then, uh, Eric, I mentioned that Tesla was a very smart man, but it was Westinghouse who saw the future of his genius and was willing to use his own capital to bring about the modern age. And uh, that's another subject that we could go into. But let's uh, quickly get uh, over to Boston right now and talk with Joe. Good evening, Joe. Good evening, Harry, first time caller, although I don't always agree with you. I hear you. Uh, I think we can have a fair discussion. Disagree and still be friends? Yes, let's, <laughs> let's both talk at the same time. Yeah, okay, I've heard Alex Jones on your network. I don't know whether you agree with him. He's against the government doing a lot of things. But as far as his income tax, you may want to look into a Brent Johnson. Uh, I'm sorry, what is the name again? Brent Johnson. He's on uh, oh, another network. Uh, I, let me just go into my start menu. I'm blind. I have a talking computer. It's not that good. Let me just get the website. Um, well, tell us, while you're doing that, tell us what Brent Johnson says. Brent Johnson says you do not have to, to pay taxes. He says, you know, he lives, yeah, the voice of freedom. I don't know where it's www something else. But yes, he, I, I have heard of that. Go ahead. Uh, he lives outside the system. He doesn't have a social security number. He doesn't even use a driver's license. He has an international permit. Now, I don't know how he's doing this, but you may want to have him on as a guest. You can really let him show you because he has been doing this for years. Yes, I really would not like to because I am so sick of this subject and I'm so sick of people telling me that they have found the Holy Grail and then I have to wave goodbye to them a few years later I know, I know, when they go off to prison. The only reason I mention this is because er he, he admitted that Irwin Schiff is doing some things wrong. He, he did it. And, uh, I, I just think that he's the one person you wouldn't mind trying it out with, reading his stuff, because, and he, he says he walks the walk and talks the talk, and he's had no problems. And if this is so, there, there are ways of doing this. Anyway, well, I can imagine that there are people in the IRS who are aware of Brent Johnson and think the clock is ticking, and when it gets up to the point where, there's, where the liability is about twenty-five dollars or $50,000 in back taxes and penalties, that it's time to, to jump on him, take him to court, and uh, it'll not be worth a while to go through all of that. I don't know, but you, but you may want to just... Sure. On that, on that, yeah. Well, I appreciate the suggestion. One thing I did not mention earlier, and I meant to mention when we came back from the break, was that all of this does not mean that I think that all aspects of the income tax are constitutional because they clearly are not. But those, that's, that's another that. question. I mean, you cannot treat somebody as guilty until proven innocent. You cannot invade his privacy. You cannot impose involuntary servitude uh, and still be constitutional. A lot of people but, that's that. a, but that's a different question from whether the income tax code itself requires people to pay income tax under the legal system that exists as unconstitutional as the legal system is right now. If you have anything further to say, Joe, hang on. And we'll be right back. Uh, we have Joe on uh, Boston on the line, and Joe, we're just about out of time, so if you have a final statement. Yeah, first tell George, listen, listen one, listen two, or out. I just really wish, Harry, and I'm not saying this to be mean, you, I, I know you're probably a libertarian, and a lot of the social programs don't work, but people today don't care. That's why we have government, and that's why uh, like people like myself have been through a lot. And I really wish you would look at Grant's course, and maybe we'll have him on, even though 
you're furious about the subject because he seems to be doing it okay, and he has the Supreme Court. Yeah, okay, I understand, Joe, but I have seen lots of so many people that seem to be know, doing okay, and I'm really sick of the subject, and I'm sick of people telling me that I don't know what I'm talking I about uh, when I have been looking at this for 25 years. Okay, but I, I appreciate, and I'm not talking about you, Joe. I, I appreciate and understand why you feel the way you do, and I'm more than happy that you called in, and I'm uh, thing, even doubly you, happy that you listen okay, to the show. One thing, can you let me know our, uh, why, uh, what your view is on government programs, uh, how they could work if people don't care? That's why we have a government because a lot of people we don't need this. We you don't need that, but you know. uh, Joe, I don't believe that. But if you would call in next week and raise that question when we have time to explore it, I think you're touching on something very, very important. Okay, can I have George again because we're off the air and listen one listen. Sure, to. George, just keep him on the line and you can talk to uh, George Brzezinski, being the engineer who kept us on the air tonight, uh, for which I'm grateful. One final thought on this paying income tax from Pierre who very often gets right to the heart of the matter with an email. Income taxes being exclusively applicable to foreigners is madness. Why the heck would the U.S. government enforce an income tax that only applies to, to non-Americans or to Americans overseas? And, and Pierre is exactly right. Why in the world would the income tax code be written that way? Every year, Congress tinkers with the code in some way or other. If there were such a big, gigantic hole in it that you could walk through, then why in the world wouldn't this year or last year or the year before, wouldn't Congress have just plugged up that hole? Obviously, they want your money. So why would they tell you uh, in the income tax code that you didn't have to pay income tax? Uh, you could say, well, then maybe congressmen don't want to pay income taxes. But they do pay income taxes. They reveal their tax returns all the time when running for office. They are paying it. So it's not as though they're exempt from it, and they're writing the, the code. Why wouldn't they take advantage of whatever Brent Johnson or, or uh, Larkin Rose or Irwin Schiff or any of these people claim can be done? Definitely the income tax is touches on all kinds of unconstitutional things. But then two trillion of the two and a half trillion dollars the government spends every year is on projects that are unconstitutional, so that shouldn't be a surprise. Thanks so much for listening tonight. I hope you'll come back next week when we'll uh, tackle some other controversial subject. This is Harry Brown. Have a good week. Do something nice for yourself and your family this week and enjoy your life. Good night. Good night.